tonight we have a program by Mike Hunger. Mike has been in Salem for 25 years or more, but moved, but he and his wife got a vacation uh, home down in Green Valley uh, in the Tucson area about 2012 and started taking classes at the local community uh, center there, as well as from Tucson Audubon on birds. Started going on field trips and taking classes. Mike's a uh, veteran uh, student. And uh, so that really launched him into birds in a big way. And in 2016, 17, he started getting involved in Salem Audubon's field trips and started developing workshops and classes. To date, he's developed about 70, 75 classes for Salem Audubon. But tonight he's gonna to present a topic uh, near and dear to his heart on Southeast Arizona. Mike. Okay, thank you, Tim. So about um, 2021, I gave a presentation here before Birders Night and it was on Southeast Arizona birds. So after some time here, I thought to Harry and said, why don't we have one on Southeast Arizona nature and include everything that's in Arizona, Southeast Arizona. So then that's how I came up with this presentation. So this is what a lot of people think Arizona looks like. Barren land, sand, cactus. But really many times this is what it's like just glorious, at least during the monsoon season. And sometimes we're wondering, well, what do we consider Southeast Arizona? Well, here you can see the map is outlined in green. We have Tucson right here in the middle, Pima County, Santa Cruz County, Cochise County, up here you got Pinal County, and some people consider Graham County as part of Southeast Arizona too. I spend most of my time probably right in this area right there. And then on the right there, that's the Sonoran Desert. And it naturally goes into Mexico and up into Arizona and slightly into Southern California. So here's an actual map with some of the towns, like we say Tucson, here's Green Valley and where Madera Canyon is. We got Patagonia, where Patent Center for Hummingbirds, uh, Violet Crowned Hummingbird is the bird people like to see. Sierra Vista, this area here, right down here, you have Ramsey Canyon, Miller Canyon, Ash Canyon, quite a few great birding places here. And then when we go out to Wilcox, you have uh, the Co Lake Cochise and the golf course there. You got the Sulphur Springs uh, Valley, which is very good in the winter. Uh, for hawks and uh, and then over here Porto uh, where the Sheratawas are and there they get a lot of birds coming up from Mexico and they see quite a few rarities. Let's have a little video here. I'm not sure if we'll go through the whole thing but uh, If you live in Southern Arizona, you know there's no place in the world quite like it. The Sonoran Desert casts a spell. The mountains beckon on every horizon, and the wide skies go from piercing blue to dazzling displays of clouds and light. We know this is a special place, yet many of us don't realize just how special it is, thanks to the mountains that rise above our desert basins. We call those mountains sky islands, Islands because they rise up above the hot dry valleys, just like islands in the ocean rise above the water. Altogether, the mountains and valleys host an incredible abundance of plants and animals. In fact, there are more species of plants and animals in the Sky Islands region, more kinds of life than anywhere else in the United States. We call that biodiversity. When we add up all the kinds of life that live in a place, the trees, the plants, the birds, the insects, the mammals, the frogs and lizards, then we can measure the biodiversity and compare it to other places. Our sky islands 
have amazing biodiversity. The mountains that form the Sky Island region extend from Southern Arizona into Northern Mexico, 55 mountain ranges in all. And because this area contains similar plants, animals, and climate, scientists call it a bioregion. So how did this bioregion come to support so much biodiversity? It all starts with the rocks, the rocks that shape the land. Geology is the study of rocks and land and how the land was formed over millions of years. In our Sky Island region, the shape of the land makes all the difference. Geologists call the landscape here basin and range because there are low flat valleys, the basins, in between high mountains, the ranges. Both the basins and the ranges tend to extend north and south. The vistas are gorgeous. Most of the mountain ranges in the Sky Island region formed around 15 million years ago, when the continent of North America was stretched from east to west. The rock that forms the crust of the earth cracked along faults, so the valleys dropped down and the mountains lifted up to form the basin and range landscape we see today. Much of the research that helped us understand how the basin and range landscape formed took place right here at U of A. Geologist George Davis from the UA Department of Geosciences was one of the researchers who helped discover how the region formed. The mountains make the great abundance of life here, the biodiversity, possible. That's because as you go up the Sky Island Mountains, the climate becomes cooler and wetter. Water brings life and the mountains bring water. The mountains receive more than twice as much water in the form of rain and snow as the basins. They also help to store and distribute the water. Some of the water is used by plants and trees. Some is held in the soil. Some flows down streams and canyons, and some seeps through cracks in the rocks to fill aquifers. Giant underground lakes, like the aquifer that supplies Tucson with the water that we use every day. Also, if it were not for our mountains, we would not have our seasonal monsoon storms. We receive about half of our annual rainfall from monsoon storms. The mountains make the monsoon happen. We know that the mountains bring water. They also create different places to live for different kinds of plants and animals. Some plants and animals have evolved in the desert so they don't need as much water. Some have evolved high in the mountains so they can endure the freezing winter temperatures. As the habitat changes, depending on the height of the land, called the elevation, so do the plants and animals. Different plants and animals live at different elevations. Scientists call the different habitat levels life zones. At the bottom sits the desert life zone with its distinctive varieties of cactus. Going up, the desert merges into the thorn scrub life zone. Above the thorn scrub, the habitat shifts to dry semi-desert grassland. Higher up, around 4,500 feet in elevation, the open oak woodland life zone covers the landscape. Above 6,500 feet, the habitat becomes pine forest, just like the forests much farther north in Colorado or Canada. Part of the incredible biodiversity in the Sky Islands comes from the life zones. At the same time, there are many plants and animals from nearby regions that come together in this area. There are plants and animals from the Rocky Mountains in the north, from the Neotropics and Sierra Madre Mountains in the south, from the Sonoran Desert to the west, and from the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert to the east. All those plants and animals from different habitats meet in the Sky Islands region. Because all these habitats come together here, it is the only place in the world where you can find jaguars, ocelots, mountain lions, and bobcats all in the same habitat. The Sky Islands give us our beautiful Southern Arizona landscape and world-class biodiversity. They have also inspired a diversity of people, people who explore, study, and celebrate the natural wonders of this region. Thousands of people enjoy the Sky Island Mountains every year thanks to our national forests, national parks, and state parks. Dozens of scientists at the University of Arizona study the rocks, the mountains, the trees, plants, animals, insects, and climate patterns of the Sky Island region. Some of the researchers here work on an interdisciplinary project called the Critical Zone Observatories, or CZO, 
sponsored by the National Science Foundation. The CZO looks at how all the Earth systems work together to enable this abundance of life. There's so much to discover here. Many nonprofit organizations like the Sky Island Alliance, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, and the Nature Conservancy work to preserve and communicate the wonders of the region. And many government agencies make it possible for us to explore and appreciate the enchanting Sky Islands. All of these groups and the individual researchers, land managers, amateur naturalists, volunteers, and people who just love the Sky Islands are working together to share what they learn and better understand the astonishing web of life in the Sky Islands. What we have learned is that all the systems that sustain life here are deeply interconnected. The Earth systems depend on each other to work in balance and harmony. Fundamental natural cycles like the water cycle, the energy cycle, and the carbon cycle can be understood separately, but really they work together, linked in a complex dance that sustains life. Some of those interconnected systems, like the climate, are being pushed in new directions by human behavior. As our world heats up, the effects will be felt everywhere, and especially in the Sky Islands. Fire will alter the landscape, habitats will change, and some species will be pushed out, possibly to extinction. Yet life in the Sky Islands has evolved and endured for millions of years. It all started with the rocks, the geology, the mountains bring water, and water brings life. Life has populated this landscape all the way from the dry deserts on the bottom to the cool, wet pine forests at the top in an abundance that is dazzling to behold. Those of us who live in Southern Arizona are lucky to live among the Sky Islands, and we hope that our children and their children after them will be able to enjoy the diverse beauty of this amazing natural resource. Okay, there. It's a really, I think, a really good summary video um, of Southern Arizona. And here you can see what they were talking about the life zones, or they also are called biomes, but the desert basin down here. And as you go up, you can just see the habitat change. If you drive up Mount Lemon on Catalina Highway and drive up to the top, uh, the Summer Haven, you can just see as you go up the plants, the flowers, the birds, trees, everything just changes. Also, um, there's 16 different uh, habitats in Arizona too. You, most people just think of the desert, but uh, by Flagstaff, a lot of forest, and uh, so there's a lot of other uh, habitats. We're gonna start looking at nature now that's there wildlife of the desert, Gila monsters, of course the scorpions. If you own a house, you know about scorpions and termites. And here's all of the different mammals, or at least some of them. They do have bears. I've seen a bear there. And up uh, down in Arizona, we call it cougars, but they call them mountain lions. So a little bit different of a wording. This is one of my favorite mammals. It's a uh, coll collared peccary, also known as a javelina. It's not a pig. It's uh, about four to five feet long. They weigh about uh, 50 to 60 pounds. How fast do you think they can run? They look like they have a little bit of a pot belly there. And stuff. So how, how far fast do you think they can run? Huh? 40. Okay. Any other guesses? 22 miles per hour. It's pretty fast. Here's one with a little baby. And I was just down there less than a week ago. And this is what we saw uh, only 40 feet away from us. There was about uh, six of them. And so it was just awesome. Paul Evans did. Um, took this photo of them. Some of the other ones, you can see the coyote in the upper left, the mountain lions, a lot of bobcats around. They introduced bighorn sheep up into the uh, uh, mountains. They're the Santa Catalinas. 
they're doing pretty well from what I've heard. Kit Fox is white-tailed deer, but most of the time I believe we have black-tailed deer here. The Kota, Kota Monday, the lower left uh, photo, we see those up at Santa Rita Lodge sometimes crawling around the water feature. Black bear, lots of those long-eared rabbits running around. And squirrels, different kinds of squirrels. Yeah, I've never thought of badgers being down there, but they have badgers, the Arizona badgers. Now, this is pretty interesting. The kangaroo rats, I just took a class on kangaroo rats. In fact, tonight, I'm supposed to be having a class on wasps, but at least I can see it afterwards. Um, now, I want you to watch this next picture. It should automatically play and see this kangaroo rat and what happens. Let's see if it's... Going to go on its own. Naturally, no, it won't. It happens pretty quick. Okay, here it comes. Ooh, ooh, that's a close call now. Ew, that snake thought it had it. But a kangaroo rat. And a lot of these mammals, like those little ones like that, uh, get uh, little burrows and stuff, and they have like Make, make almost like a home and have different burrows around to uh, sleep in. And to also, they have little tunnels around so that they can get away from prey. Oh, now it works. It's worth seeing one more time. That's close call. <laughs> and there are snakes in Arizona. Uh, quite a few snakes to be exhibited. Um, I was thinking the number 13 species of rattlesnake live in Arizona. There's 36 uh, overall in the U.S. Some of the main ones that uh, the coral snake, the western diamond bat rattlesnake, uh, the black rattlesnake, or a few of them. Oh, and of course the western hognose, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, but it's very interesting down there. It's a whole different uh, scene is that one time we were out and we saw the fire department come by in Green Valley. And it turns out there was a rattlesnake under somebody's barbecue. The landscape people were there uh, cleaning up and pull out the barbecue. There was a big rattlesnake. Well, what happens is the fire department will come, get the rattlesnake, put it in a box and take it out and relocate it someplace else. So that was pretty interesting. And here's the Arizona Ridge-Node Rattlesnake. It's the state reptile in Arizona. Let's see if, I guess I'm gonna have to start the videos. This is the ridge nose Rattlesnake. It's Arizona's state reptile, as well as an endangered protected species. Good thing he has a telephoto lens. And look at the markings on his face there. Yep, right there at his face. Up, it's rattling it. He's ready to strike. But there's the, the Western Diamondback rattlesnake. It's the one of the most venomous of them. Now, the snakes like this, they're venomous, not poisonous. There is a difference. Here's one wanting to grab something. Here you can see the head. Now I did want to make a very good point here. It's mostly 
underage males, and usually when they're drinking or something, that they are going to try to pet the snake or pick it up. Bad idea, because here's what can happen in the lower left corner. Your finger can look pretty bad. But uh, up in the upper right is where the habitat, where they live. We can see the head here. The one in the upper left corner, that's a young uh, rattlesnake. Here are some more venomous rattlesnakes in Arizona. The black rattlesnake in the lower right corner. The coral snake, a very pretty snake. Now here's some of the non-venomous ones. The long-nosed snake, you can see how it gets its name uh, right here, all this long part here. reptiles. Of course, the snakes are reptiles too. The Gila monster, you want to stay away from it. They can be pretty vicious. We'll get into the insects now. The two-tailed swallowtail butterfly is a state insect for Arizona. Here you can see there's lots of neat butterflies, dragonflies, damselflies down there. Once you get into May, uh, on into through the summer and stuff, just lots of uh, nice butterflies. Here are some of them. Names wouldn't all fit in, but I have them numbered and with the, the description what they are there on the left side. But real beautiful butterflies. And there's moths. A lot of people don't like moths for some reason, but uh, they think, you know, they're going to eat their clothes or uh, whatever, but there's a lot of pretty uh, moths. And here's some of them. I love this one down in the corner here, the white line sphinx moth here is very beautiful. Of course, that's pretty nice too. Grasshoppers. I mean, look at the wings on some of those and the colors. And like this one right here, some really nice designs on them. Here's, these are mostly all beetles. Like, I think there's uh, 400,000 beetles, a uh, species of beetles. They're among the largest, most successful groups of organisms, making up one fifth of all plant and uh, animal species. This is a millipede. And you can see on the lower right how it curls up when somebody gets near it. This is defense mechanism. The Madera Canyon uh, tarantula. So hiking up the super trail at the top of, uh, um, okay, the Santa Rita's and going, you go up past uh, Santa Rita Lodge to the very top where it dead ends. You can park up there. There's restroom. Uh, there's trails both on the left and on the right as you're facing up the mountain. If you go up the left one, a good place for peanut red starts and owls up there at night. When you go uh, up the left side, the super trail, you can walk way up. And I was walking up, uh, my wife and I with one of our friends, and underneath this rock was one of these big tarantulas. I had to leave these in some mayflies. Fishermen can use them for fishing. Oh, and the tarantula hawk. This uh, seven spotted ladybug. Now, 
There's on the right the scorpion, and on the left are the uh, termites. You got to be real careful when you live down there, and you have to have monthly or quarterly people come out and spray and stuff to keep uh, these uh, away and keep them at bay. We'll get into some dragonflies now. They have just dozens and dozens of dragonflies. I try to pick out my favorite here, and I just can't uh, pick out my favorite. I like them all. Here's some damselflies. The Arizona State Bird, the cactus wren. When I went on a hike at uh, Vistosa Trails, it's a new uh, natural area up in Oro Valley. Uh, there used to be an old golf course there that's no longer a golf course. I guess they didn't have enough water or something, but they turned it into a natural area, and there were just cactus wrens all over the place. It's, this is what you hope. Oh, it didn't play it. This is what you'll hear all over the place. Sort of like a car trying to start. That's how I always I remember it. But yeah, you'll hear those all over. Here's some of the other birds you can see. Really light. Uh, my wife's favorite, the Marillion flycatcher. Nice picture of the gambler's quail here. You'll see quite a few curb bill thrashes around. My wife took this picture. We were uh, renting a, a VR, uh, VO place and had a nice deck out there. And every day, this uh, roadrunner would come by. And this time it happened to have a lizard. But we saw him every single day we were there for like a week and a half. That was the best trip we had as far as roadrunners, nine roadrunners. Sometimes I can go there and not even see a single one. Some nice summer birds, summer year round. There's the wild turkeys that you can uh, see up at uh, Madera Canyon, Santa Rita Lodge, usually 17 to 20 of them there. They're Gould's subspecies. And just uh, like I said, I was there a week ago, and here is a northern beardless triannulette. Uh, Paul Evans took this photo, a really nice photo. We got really good looks at them. Usually you don't get that good of looks, but I know it. Agua Calalente uh, Park, they actually nest there and saw one on a nest. Here's some of the woodpeckers. My favorite is the here, upper left corner, the Arizona woodpecker, the only brown woodpecker in the United States. Of course, the um, ladder back woodpecker is one that's down there, and the Gila woodpecker. Now the hummingbirds, for anybody going on our trip in August, this is one thing that we're hoping for to get uh, 10 to 12 hummingbird species. Uh, we'll be going to Beatty's. Uh, it's in Miller Canyon. But the white ear is known to go there. And we got uh, Rivoli's, used to be called the magnificent hummingbird. When we get up on uh, into Catalinas and up high, um, we can see the broad-tailed hummingbird, the lower left. And of course, the star of the show here, the upper left corner, the violet crown hummingbird at Patton Center for Hummingbirds. The most common hummingbird you'll see is the broad bill hummingbird. And the bird in the center, uh, the lucifer hummingbird, likely we'll see that at Ash Canyon uh, Bird Sanctuary. I haven't been there one time yet. I haven't seen it. This, I probably just jinxed it. 
Here are some other ones like the bridal tip mouse. They have a uh, different species of purple martin that they have nest boxes all around the desert purple martin. Tucson Audubon has a special program in working with the, those. Uh, near Tubac, along the Santa Cruz River, they have the green kingfisher that's been around there. Some people have seen as many as five, which is very unusual. A couple of years ago, they weren't along the river there in Tubac. The Bell's Vireo are usually always around. And the Crestus caracaris here is a type of raptor. It's in its own family, but uh, you see those mainly in the winter, Santa Cruz Flats which is north of Tucson. So these are, I put these birds on because these are the ones everybody is wanting to go down there. If you talk to a birder, these are the birds I want to see. So the elegant trogon, Tim and I had a great look at an elegant trogon when we were there one summer. Uh, I mean, it was from me to Kathy away. I'm, uh, and Tim got some great photos of it. The five-striped sparrow, we have a closer place. Now there's one up in the Santa Catalinas. Instead of going up Madera Canyon, you take a left and you go like you're going towards a, a Florida Canyon and keep going. Uh, it'll take you all the way over to Highway 82, which takes you down to Sonoida. But uh, there in Box Canyon on the way, they're nesting there now, this five-striped sparrow. Of course, the Montezuma quail, that might be the number one tied between that and the elegant trogon. I've seen a pair of those at the Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary, just south of Sierra Vista. And we got the yellow-billed cuckoo. You can see that up at Montosa Canyon, which is right down in the Green Valley area. Of course, I can't leave out fish since Tim and some other fishermen are here from the San Ian Flycatcher, a San Ian Flycatcher. The state fish is the Apache trout. Now we'll get into some trees. The Palo Verde really blooms, nice yellow blooms in the summer. Here we've got the ironwood. Nice sort of purplish pink flowers. Velvet mesquite. I know a lot of us, uh, when we own the place, we hate these because they drop all these little things all over your yard and they're hard to pick up. The desert willow. Very interesting plant. The acacia. They're interesting little flowers, all puffy little. The Arizona sycamore. Normally you see these all along the creeks and uh, they need to be near water. There's how they bloom. But the one thing you like about the sycamores, that's where the elegant trogons hang out. Alligator juniper, really like this with the bark here. It's just really, it's like an alligator skin. Some plants and flowers. Boglevelia. The cactus, of course, that's the star of the show, the saguaro cactus. You can see all the different plant life here. And even a quail up here hanging out. And of course, a rabbit. So, this world cactus. It's a neat cactus. They can get real tall. Uh, it takes uh, hundreds of years for them to grow the arms. And, um, and you can go like to Saguaro National Park and drive through, especially the east uh, one. Uh, Park 
you can drive through and it's about nine miles. Normally it takes me about an hour and a half, two hours to drive through there. Here you can see the teddy bear Choya. Yep, and once the uh, uh, flowers bloom, the nice little blooms, a lot of these cactus have nice blooms. But this is the one you really need to stay away. <clears throat> the jumping choya. People don't believe me and stuff. I, we brought a friend down here in November and uh, we told her, don't get near this one. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, bad. Oh, yeah, this was nothing. And gets right close to it. One of the quills comes out and pokes her in the thumb. And one comes and hits her in the uh, shoe and goes right through her soul. And so they can really, it's true. They're, they seem to just jump out. Here's a hedgehog uh, cactus. The barrel cactus. And the nice thing down there, I learned another thing when I was out on a group uh, taking a bird walk this past week is that uh, you can tell the difference. Like sometimes you see swirls are that small. So you can tell the swirl versus the barrel cactus because the swirl, uh, some of these little quills there are pointing down, but they point up on the barrel cactus. So learn something new every time. prickly pear cactus. I really like these, especially the ones here, the Santa Rita prickly pear cactus that turns purple. One of my favorites. The Oregon pipe cactus. There's some around there. Of course, there's an Oregon pipe national uh, park uh, further east of uh, Tucson, but it's right next to the border. And, Sometimes there's a lot of people crossing there. We'll get into a few of the flowers and plants. Amaranth. The fairy duster. Vervine. It comes in several different colors. I really like that because they're in bloom a lot of the year. Hurdle bush, see that when you're out hiking. A lot of these come, uh, especially the desert plants, come out to bloom usually mid July through September is when the monsoon season is. And like you saw in the video, they uh, Fifty percent of the rainfalls comes during uh, that time period, the monsoons. Ocotillo, some call ocotillo, or but uh, really nice. As soon as it rains and stuff, it seems like these bloom with their nice red blossoms. A lot of the birds like them. Talk a little bit about the geology. I mean, looks like I might get done a little early. Um, so a lot of uh, nice rock formations like we saw in the video. And we saw in the video how it forms and how it stretched out and the valleys dipped and the mountains rose from there. This is from the Sky Island Alliance. It does a lot there for the environment and environmental uh, things. Here's some of the sky islands. You can see all the mountain ranges. Way out to the east, you have the Chiricahuas. Now, like right here is Tucson. So you got the Santa Catalinas, the Rincons, the Santa Rita Mountains. Now, what it doesn't show is there's right here, down here is the Tucson Mountains. And down here is the Green Valley. And right behind Green Valley is the Cerrita Mountains. So just a lot of mountains. And of course, down by Sierra Vistas, the Huachucas, uh, very well known for all their canyons. 
that's where the Washukas are where Ramsey Canyon, Miller Canyon, and Aft Canyon are all located. Here's the Sherikawas and some of the hoodoos and rock formations. This is driving up uh, Catalina Highway in the Santa uh, Catalinas. You can see the highway here and how it winds up. It can be pretty windy. It takes a long time to get up there, but when you're birding, you're stopping at every other stop, then doesn't seem quite so long. During our trip in August, we will be going there for sure. A couple other peaks, including Picasso Peak. It's a little north of uh, Tucson. And right behind it to the west is where Santa Cruz Flats is, a great birding place for the winter. This Baba Quarry uh, Peak, it's further to the west of uh, Tucson near the Buena Aires National Wildlife Refuge. Now, we talked about biodiversity. Arizona is number three in the U.S. in biodiversity. And you can see I compared it to Oregon. Oregon's number eight. Uh, so you can sort of see, but the fish is the only place where Oregon, I mean, where Oregon wins out. So quite a bit of biodiversity, but you can see here, it's not that far off, really. 300 species is not bad. Now, why isn't Arizona number one? Huh? The coast, the Pacific Ocean, because California is number one because of the Pacific Ocean. Um, boy, I should have looked, remembered that. I don't recall now. Probably, trying, probably yeah. No, not Hawaii. Yeah, it is either Texas or Florida. So now I'm going to take you to uh, the Arizona nature uh, vacation. So you're ready to go down there. This uh, presentation has made you, I got to go. So now here uh, is some things will welcome you to Arizona. It is the Grand Canyon State. Here's some of the signs you're going to see that you might not be used to. Watch out for venomous creatures, definitely the snakes and other things. Open range. Remember, when you're driving some of the back roads, the cattle have the right of way. You better not run over any cattle or you're going to be paying for it. Lots of dips, and definitely uh, pay attention to that. When it's flooded, you don't enter low areas or big dips. If you get stuck, they have to come and rescue. You pay for the rescue. And this is cool sign. Wish we had these here. But during the day, it shows this sign. When you turn on your headlights, it blanks out the top sign, and you see 35. Pretty cool concept. And Arizona roads, they're a heck of a lot better than Oregon by far. They know somebody, they have architects and people that can really build roads. And gas is cheaper in Arizona most of the time. It's gone up a little recently. When I first got there last week, it was 309 a gallon. And when I left, it was 369. Of course, spring break's coming, so the, I guess they had to make some money. Um, the school zone, it's 15 there, not 20 miles per hour. And the one thing about the school zone, I like them in Arizona a lot better. I guess I better move there. Um, but anyway, it, it, the school zones aren't for a mile like they are here in Oregon. They're a short distance where the crosswalk actually is. You'll run into the border patrol when you're out driving around. For example, if you drive from Green Valley down to Nogales, uh, when you come back uh, northbound, you'll come to this station here where they'll check you. Most of the time, um, 
they take a look at your car, they take a look at you and stuff. And most of us, they'll just say, go through and you hardly even have to stop. But once in a while, they will uh, stop you. Uh, they also have this dog here walking around sniffing for drugs. Some of the places where you can visit Sweetwater Wetlands, one of the best places there is in uh, Tucson. They have 315 species of birds that have been observed there, which is outstanding. You can sort of see here, when you come from the parking lot over here, there's some restrooms right over here. You'll walk over and go across this bridge. I normally go off to the right and go down, and then you'll come to this little covered area here on the left-hand side, and you look over this pond that usually has quite a few ducks on it, and just can walk all around the entire area and can see quite a few birds there. And they get a lot of rarities, too, that come through here. You can sort of see some of the ponds over here that they have, and there's about four or five ponds. No, this is uh, City of Tucson and the Water uh, Conservation District. And anybody can come there, it's open to the public. Sometimes, though, you go there, and during a certain period of the year, I think it was just uh, late February, they, it, a lot of reeds and stuff grow up here, and they get real tall, so you can't even see into the ponds, and so they burn them all down. And so sometimes it's not a, the greatest time to go there, at least to see uh, in the ponds. Madera Canyon, you can't miss Madera Canyon if you go down there. You can see some of the bird feeders at uh, Santa Rita Lodge here. They have a lot of feeders, uh, hummingbird feeders in the front, and these other feeders, suet feeders and seed feeders in the back. I can see just, oh, tons of birds. Uh, we saw a Rivoli's hummingbird, a paddock tanager, uh, rhido titmouse, um, Arizona woodpecker, acorn woodpecker. Uh, the turkeys are walking down there and just eating all the fallen uh, seed. Um, you can see a lot of the other hummingbirds there too. Mexican jays, there's just quite a few uh, birds you can see there. This is just another trail at Madera Canyon, the right photo. Patagonia area. Another place that can't be missed. On the uh, left is a photo from Patton Center of Hummingbirds. So they cover, they've changed things around there a little bit, and they're doing some a lot of uh, different planning and building of different things there. So uh, I'm hoping I'm going to call the guy I know, Tom Brown, and he said in August we might hit a bad time when they're doing. Uh, some construction and stuff, and they're going to close it. That would be a sin to have to miss that. But we're going to try to arrange our trip around that. La Cienega is a national conservation area. It's just probably about an hour south of uh, Tucson. A nice, huge grassland, 45,000 acres. You can see a lot of, uh, you know, the grassland birds in there. Uh, seen uh, blue grosbeak and uh, buried bunting. The uh, right side photo is Lake Patagonia. This is the birding trail. You walk down, you park at the far uh, east end of the park, walk down these stairs. Some of them are a little rickety. Go through a gate and walk down and go down this trail. Uh, and you can see way in the back, I've seen elegant trogon, lots of uh, ladderback woodpeckers, bridal titmouse. Uh, you can see quite a bird, few birds. And then when you go around the corner, you can come over to the one little end of the lake and see some of the cormorants and things like that and the other ducks. But it's a neat walk. You can also go to the other end of the lake and um, there's a little visitor center there. In the winter, you can actually take uh, 
little boat trips and they have a boat trip where you can go and see all the black crowned night herons that are lining up the edge of the lake and sometimes there's a hundred or two hundred of them there but it's a neat little uh, boat trip and then of course santa cruz flats if you're going there in the winter this is a place that can't be missed that's where the crested caracaras are there's a lot of meadow larks uh, the raptors of all kinds. Uh, also, one of the things people look for, burrowing owls along the roadside and mountain plovers. They look like a moving dirt clod if you try to in your scope to see. Uh, Kanoa Ranch Conservation Park. Fairly new, I think it's about 10 years old. It's one of the neatest uh, places my wife's favorite place, so we always go there. Um, but we'll always see the red uh, redhead duck there. You can see the lake here. You can just walk around the lake. And then there's also a trail uh, further out where sometimes you can see Virginia rail and some other birds out there. We uh, This last trip last week, we saw uh, loggerhead shrike and uh, quite a few other birds there. Another great place to visit, uh, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. It does cost about $28 unless you buy a pass for the year, which I do every year since I go there several times a year. Uh, but if you want to see what the uh, deserts out west is like, this is the greatest place to go. I mean, it has all kinds of exhibits, uh, the sn uh, snakes, reptiles, uh, plants, fish. Uh, you can also walk around. They have it's like a mini zoo, but I don't call it a zoo. They have javelinas. They have an indoor uh, hummingbird aviary. Uh, they have uh, in the summer they have the raptor free flight. They call it uh, where you walk down. You go up this gravel way with fences on each side. They have these little dead trees all around the area, and they'll call these raptors out. And like a great horned owl will come and they'll just fly right over your head. Um, Harris's hawk, uh, quite a few uh, falcons. They have quite a few birds and they'll have about four or five docents there around at these trees and they'll place a little thing like a piece of meat or something that that bird like and they'll see it and they'll say, hey, and the bird will just come zoom. And that's the neatest thing to see. Uh, but yeah, they have the um, the rocks and uh, things, and they have this thing that you go through for the rocks, and they have a lot of other exhibits. But part of our trip uh, in August, we'll be going there. Get there early in the morning during the summer because it's going to be hot. But they give you sunscreen, and there's water fountains that are really cold and stuff, so not too bad. Some of the other tourist sites you can see maybe don't want to be birding all day, like Tim. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, we say the San Xavier Mission, they call it the White Dove of the Desert. It's a neat place to see. On Sundays, the, uh, some of the uh, Mexicans, Hispanics have uh, little places where you buy fry bread and some of the other things they make, tacos and stuff. Uh, we got Tumacacri, which is a mission. Uh, it's a little south of Tubac, which is south of Green Valley along I-19. Just have to go off the road a little bit. And it's neat to see if you have a National Park Pass, it doesn't cost anything to get in there. Tombstone, of course, you have uh, the courthouse, which is neat to look through. And you have all the other sites and stuff of Tombstone. And of course, the shopping. Tubac has neat little shops, fairly expensive, but they have very unique things there and uh, all kinds of different shops. Also, they have a mining tour, this Asarco uh, mining tour near Saharita, which just is north of Green Valley. And you can go there, I think it costs $9 or something, but they take you in this big bus and you get to drive up and see the mine and go see through where they 
process uh, the uh, is copper. Co uh, after all, Arizona is a copper state, and a grain fusion state. But uh, they'll uh, mine the copper, and they use all this water to filter it through, and it goes through strainers and all kinds of things. You see these big uh, uh, tractors and things that they use to uh, uh, mine it. And this huge, their tires, I, the tires I can reach like this and not reach the top of the tire. Uh, so huge, uh, it's a great tour. And our big announcement, which a lot of people already know and signed up for, is uh, our trip to Southeast Arizona in August. We have one opening left only, but it'll be a great time. Uh, basically, I have anybody that's interested, see me afterwards, and I've got a handout that you can have that will explain some of it. And boy, I'm way early, but I guess nobody will mind. And if anybody has some questions, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Um, the question was, on one of my charts I had, it showed pine forest on one of the charts. And yes, it did. Um, let's see. The easiest way to get to that chart. Right. Yeah, there are a lot of forests there. So let me, what I'm going to do is go back and start. Go start over. There we go. Um, there we go. This was the thing you're finding, uh, or that you're talking about, Mike, Michael. That, uh, so here are the uh, Sky Islands and. Uh, as you go up the Sky Islands, so here we are down in Tucson, for example, and you'll go up desert scrub, then we have desert grassland, then you start getting some oaks and get oak grassland. And each step up, like here's oak woodland, and there's also chaparral here, and then you get to pine oak woodland, then pine forest, and then mixed conifer forest. Now it's interesting, on the south facing slopes, that's where the chaparral is. They don't have that on the north side for some reason. Um, but uh, there's a book right back here that explains all this. Let me walk back here just quick and I'll be right back. This book, I'll wait till I get up there. But this is a book right here. Uh, the Natural History of the Santa Catalina, Santa Catalina Mountains in Arizona with an introduction to the Madrean Sky Islands. And this has all that type of information. Uh, for example, let's just go to, it has it broken down by each of these biomes or life zones. And so let's take a look at one of these. Try to get to a break in the page where. They have all kinds of, oh, here we go. Drive up uh, the um, Mount Lemon Highway. So the desert scrub, for example, it has all the reptiles that you could see there, the birds, the mammals, the arthropods and gives you a description of all the different geology, et cetera. And then it also goes over the trees, the shrubs, cactus, the grasses you can see. Um, here's the reptiles, amphibians. So each uh, biome, it goes over each of the uh, things you could see there. Um, this is National Forest, Coronado National Forest. Okay, they, she, uh, it was asked um, whether these are protected lands or uh, what, who they're controlled by, and it's the 
national forest. At least this area on the Santa, Santa Catalinas. On your opening mammal chart, was that a bison on the far right? On this one? No, the mammal. Oh, yes, it was. And so the question was, was that a bison uh, on this uh, Mammals of Arizona chart? And, uh, yes, it is a bison. Just lots of diversity. I wouldn't think of a bison being there. Probably. Mike, you mentioned uh, some of the, well, when we talk about snakes, you say they're venomous, but they're not poisonous. Could you, you explain that? Uh, I wish I could better, but um, poison, uh, yeah, it's different. I, I can't really explain it. Uh, Okay. Um, okay, there's, um, Joseph makes a good point that, yeah, a poisonous, it has to get injected into you, ingest it into you, where the venom just has to uh, scrape you or touch you, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, or yeah. get by you. Okay. Hear that anywhere it can get in your blood and is venomous, where it's poison if you ingest it. Thank you. I've taken too many classes and my brain is just floating. <laughs> yes. You talked about the uh, area right at the start there about the various areas that, that, do, that go down into Mexico. Uh, concern at times about uh, the animals that migrate and we might have a border wall along there. Do we have a border wall across that area? Uh, okay, it was asked, uh, I talked about this map earlier in the presentation and we're wondering if there's a border wall there. Yes, and some of these places down along uh, the border here with Mexico there is border wall there. Um, they've tried to um, make it so some of the animals can get through. And of course, the environmental groups are always fighting with trying to uh, prevent a solid wall from being there. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of give and take. And uh, it can be pretty bad, especially when the Santa Cruz River comes up here, the San Pedro River. Sometimes if you cross that and completely block it, I mean, a lot of wildlife go up there along the rivers, so uh, it can be difficult. But in some cases, they've uh, gotten uh, write-offs where they can leave small openings and so the animals can get through. There's a question behind you from Michael. Well, I'll take the opportunity for another one, Mike. Uh, and this kind of follows up on what Ken was talking about. The, uh, the border reminds me of the question about the status of a jaguar. And you included the jaguar, and I almost wondered if it would be included in, in Arizona. Uh, but can you comment on the current status as far as it's known? Um, OK, um, Michael asked me whether or not about the jaguar and the current sta status of the jaguar. Um, as far as I know, they're doing fairly well down there that people pick them up on their wildlife cameras and uh, they do roam up and cross the border here, but they seem to be located more in the southern part of the state uh, rather than any other place. But as far as I've heard, the jaguars are doing fairly good down there. Okay, I guess. Okay, thank you.